Welcome to One Insight. My name is Rich Litvin. I grew up in London and I now live in LA. And this is a podcast for extraordinary top performers and their coaches. You see, I've coached some of the most successful and talented people on the planet. I can see what most people cannot see. And I dare to say what most people wouldn't dare to say. And what I know about success is that on the other side of it, it can be incredibly lonely. You can feel more of an imposter the more successful you become. And when you're the most interesting person in the room, you're actually in the wrong room. Clients who are more successful, more intelligent and wealthier than you need your support more than they know and more than you can imagine. I coach around insight. Life looks one way, something happens and the world looks different and your entire world changes. It can happen in an instant. And this podcast is called One Insight because a single insight can change everything. My next conversation is with someone who was really famous in the 90s, one of the world's top DJs, uh, doing live DJ set. Then built a business that, well, has made millions and millions of dollars. In fact, makes money now while he sleeps, doesn't even need to be an active partner in the business. I draw out his story, go all the way back to being a six-year-old kid who loved Star Wars and help him see how that thread has been part of his career his entire life. I find where he's had areas of his life that he thought were holding him back were actually the dark sides of his gift. And I give him four words that A, light him up, and B, literally make him speechless. He barely, he could barely think at the end of this, which is the fun I have when I nail this with people. When I draw out for them their story in a really powerful way, they literally have no words. If you're watching the video, you see his mouth opening and closing like a fish. It was a really fun conversation. As you listen, you can listen to his story, but you can also play it out for yourself. Hear the questions I'm asking him and answer them for yourself and see how you can get to the heart of who you are and what you do. Hi, Chris. Rich. Hey, great to better speak to you today. I'm excited about this. My intention is to draw out some of the stories, the way that you see the world, that it's actually hard for you to see yourself. And we'll see what we can do with that. That's something, something usually in my experiences can be very powerful for people. So, so tell me, Chris, whilst I know some of your story, there's probably bits I don't really know. Uh, what, what are a couple of the, the headlines, if people who are going to read a bio about you, there isn't time to go into all the details, some of the stuff that can be most important to us in our lives, raising children or going through a challenging experience in life. It, it's the headlines that, that have people say, oh, wow, or I know that guy. T- tell me, tell me about a couple of your headlines. Uh, um, so in, uh, most recently, I created a, a piece of software, co-founded a software automated webinar uh, platform called StealthSeminar.com, uh, which has got on to be used by 25 million people. Um, before that, amongst other things, but another thing that I did is in the 1990s, I, I, w- I was one of the best selling DJs in the world and a pioneer of what we knew then as rave. I love it. I love it how they, 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 that, that's one sentence for each. And yet for <laughs> most people listening or people who meet you is like, well, hang on a second. Yeah. Let's see what we're in the first world. A software company, 20 million people using your software. Um, yeah. Just tell me, there'll, there'll be a common question about the software company. When, when did you found that? Uh, we launched it March 2010. You still own it? Do you sell it? What's the story with that? I am 50% owner. Uh, but I've uh, stepped away from an active role. Great. So you have a business that actually brings in money without you having to be actively involved with it. Correct. Yeah. Which is beautiful. Uh, it's it's the aspiration of most people to get to that place yeah. in business. And I love that it's just a little part of, uh, of what you do. Uh, tell me back, what, what got you into, because I'll come into the DJ stuff, but mm. later when we come into your past, but how'd you go from being a DJ into a software company? What, what, what was it that, sponsor into that direction um 
So uh, by the early 2000s, uh, you know, the peak rave period had passed. Um, some things that happened to me, like I got myself banned from entering the United States for working without a work visa as a DJ. So I was forced to uh, move on from that career and look for something else. And um, I discovered stage hypnosis. <laughs> so I, uh, I went to a show and I was one of the volunteers that went on stage. And after it was over, I was like, what the hell just happened? And that led me on a uh, interest, uh, which led me to a training um, in, in being a stage hypnotist. And uh, I did that for a handful of years, doing corporate presentations in high schools. And um, But the most important part of that story is my hypnosis teacher and mentor, um, through our mentoring calls, once a week we'd be chatting, and we'd be talking about all kinds of things. And he knew I'm, <laughs> it's funny because the word nerd hasn't been said yet, but, uh, but he knew I was a nerd. And um, he asked me one day, he had an idea about this presenting recorded webinars as if they were live. And uh, could I make such a thing? And I said, I'd try. And I did. <laughs> so. Love it. And so when you say a nerd, you just love that. You you always have, is that right? Uh, I'm an old school nerd. So yeah, I grew up in the 80s when home computers were just uh, coming about, early internet. Um, and um, my, a lot of my DJ career and success came from being part of that early technological revolution, being the first listed uh uh, my musical genre that I was pushing was called happy hardcore. And within Yahoo, uh, I was the first subcategory of their electronica section for that term. And uh, it just happened to be at, at the forefront. So I'm already seeing one theme throughout everything that you've done. It's actually this, this what you call being a nerd. Uh, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm just adding tech. And um, you, you were one of the best-selling DJs in the rave scene. Uh, I, I was... My time too, but I, I wasn't really into rave. But what I know from friends who uh, were well, not one known as you, but but successful DJs, a great DJ who was doing live with a live audience, and you had thousands and thousands of people in your audiences. Yep. You're like a conductor, and you're watching the people and playing with the people and creating an experience more than just playing music. Anyone could just put on a bunch of records. You're actually there's something with people and the experience. Tell me more. You're uh, you're definitely speaking to a major part of it. You're controlling a, a, a flow of energy in the room, and uh, I prided myself on never uh, rehearsing my mixes. I would I would play by records, but I would never pre-plan a set, and I would live on the edge by not knowing what the next record was going to be until the moment it's actually on the turntable. And I'm mixing it in. So I was creating something new every single mix at great risk because you have thousands of people in front of you. Um, and this could all go badly. Um, and uh, But that was uh, like a natural high. And I think that was a big part of the success that I had then. Okay. So what I'm hearing is you have a low threshold for boredom and a high threshold for risk. And that brings a lot of energy into your body. Um, um, yeah, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> Say it. I can relate. Now, take me back to being a little kid. Yeah. Six years old, approximately. Mm. What were you doing? What did you love to do when you were around that age? Um. I mean, the thing I remember most was, uh, like a lot of kids who grew up then, I, I was a huge Star Wars um, kid, and I, I have countless memories of just playing on the floor of the bedroom or the living room with those action figures that were very popular at the time, and I had a Millennium Falcon, and, um, uh, and I know my dad, when he gave a speech at my wedding, 
when he was reflecting on how I've grown, his memory of me is of playing with those Star Wars toys. So he actually said that. Like, let, let me dive into that a little bit more because I'm yeah. curious. For me, it was uh, in England, we had something called Action Man, which I think was okay. G.I. Joe for you guys. Um, what was your flavor of that? What, what was it about? What were you doing with those toys? What were the stories you were making up? What was actually going on if we could go on a little magnifying glass and little Chris? I haven't thought about it in a long time, um, but I do remember um, uh, creating situations or scenes or, you know, like for the characters. Um, <laughs> it's funny how your memories get triggered. So it's like I'm thinking about something that had to do with poison gas or something like that. They had to escape the poison gas, but that had nothing to, that, that's not a, a storyline from Star Wars. That's just something that I was made. This, this is, this is yeah. part of the storyline about you that I, I want to draw yeah. out because I knew there'd be something in there that would be different to every other kid who's playing with Star Wars, Wars toys. So there was some kind of adventure that you created. And, and some kind of scenario where people looking at to escape from danger. And it, it lit you up. It was fun. Countless hours. Yeah. 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 It, it, it's, it's what's known as flow. When you're having so much fun that when you're a kid, your mom calls you down and it's like, you've been out there for five hours, Chris. What are you doing? I'm mean, doing the same thing you were doing five hours ago. Or yeah. when you're a DJ, you're you're creating a set and someone says the night's over you're like what I, yeah. I don't even remember barely started or when you're coding and doing the work you do on the software once yeah. again five hours have passed and it's like i haven't eaten all day i didn't even think to eat mm -hmm. flow state i think is a new t term um it's not something we used back then uh back then we might say in the zone mm -hmm. um uh, that'd be an older uh, phrase, but I've I've come to see the, the things you're talking about as flow states for sure. Yeah. yeah. Chris, what's what's been your biggest struggle for all your life? Um, no. I have to. <laughs> it's funny because this term did not exist to me until very recent years, and I've come to learn it's very common. But just that imposter syndrome. And and tell me more about that for you, the flavor of that. Give me an example of where you felt it. Um, uh, that luck had more to do with my success as a DJ than anything. Right place, right time. Um, uh, that uh when i wrote the code for stealth seminar uh um i didn't want to reveal that this former dj and hypnotist that created this platform so i i created a persona um and then i was always afraid of being found out even though people were using this thing and because you thought that old career is so different to this one they would look down on me they, they wouldn't take me seriously yeah, people have certain expectations of what it is needed to create a tech platform. Would I be right that you always show up differently? That that your way of doing things has never been the norm? It wasn't like, let me look at all the other DJs are doing, let me do it like them, which is a little bit better. Let me look at what other tech companies are doing and I'll improve on this. Um, uh, one hundred percent, uh, correct. Um, I, with hindsight, I could see that there's a comfort in creating something new. Um, I, uh, it's exciting, and um, uh, my partner that I co-founded Stealth Seminar with had tried to hire guys to do it, and they were unsuccessful. Um, and he was being told it couldn't be done. Mm. And, and would I be right that when you hear the words, it can't be done, you start to get excited? 
Uh, <laughs> like right now, I thought I'd do this. Um, if you're listening, you're listening, you're listening, sorry, yeah, yeah, so then Seth, I'm rubbing my hands together. Yeah. You know, <laughs> well, well, take me to this moment in time. So we met last year, you came to one of my deep dives, we spent three days together, and now you're in Project Kairos, my program where I work with a handful of coaches who have been readers in other fields and now want to be high-flying coaches. What are you looking, what do you want to create next? Um, uh, that's the, uh, that's the magic question. Uh, that's the thing I've been uh, trying to figure out. Um, and um, I actually had a, a part of what brought me to Project Kairos was I woke up one morning, I challenged myself and I said, as an entrepreneur, what's the problem I'm trying to solve? Yeah. And I woke up one day and the words, what's next, were with me as, as my waking thought. And that phrase has been like a monkey on my back for, for years now. Um, and... Um, so as you ask me, like, what it is that I want to create, I, or, I realize if I'm my own ultimate client, then I have to help support me in searching for that. And if I can do that, how might I help others? Nice. And, and you're, you're, you have a high quality problem, which is that you don't need a client right now. Correct. If you don't get another client this year or even the next five or 10 years, you'll be okay. You have businesses and all sorts of irons and other fires, which most people would aspire to in this coaching field that we're in. But there's also a place where it can hold you back because then well, what if I don't take action? And you'd want to because there's a desire in you to find out what's next. Um, let me ask you this. Would it be fun to work with successful leaders and entrepreneurs who are driven by the phrase, it can't be done or come to you with a project and say, I want to do this, but everyone in my field says it can't be done. Ah, uh, that would be fun. Yeah. That's my sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And my sense is that being surrounded by people who are doing things that everyone else tells them can't be done, you'd find some of your magic in how you help how you've done it yourself for so many years. So let me explain this. There are four levels of uh, competence. You may have heard this. There's unconscious incompetence. I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, there's conscious incompetence. I know I'm not doing it well. I want to get better. There's conscious competence. And the highest level is unconscious competence. When you drive your car to your, your, your see your brother or your sister and you've driven for an hour and you can't remember where you, you drove for week. There's a level above that, Chris, called mastery. And mastery is when you can look down at those things that you do incredibly well and teach it to others. So I had to help our au pair getting ready for her driving lessons the other day. It was a nightmare because I'm realizing I know when to change gear and when to slow down and when to stop. And trying to explain it to her, because I don't think about it, was really challenging me to think about and really challenging to teach. If I wanted to master that, I would learn how I do what I do unconsciously. The gift that you have in throughout your life, doing things where people say it can't be done, doing things where you feel like an imposter, because even you don't think it can be done, or if you're doing it, it feels so effortless, you feel lazy or lucky. I think it would be a gift to you to see how you've done that. And it would be an amazing gift to be able to A, teach it and be able to help individuals who have a mission in front of them where everyone else is telling them it can't be done. It would. I mean, that's, uh, that's an exciting um, thought. And when I think about sort of big problems the world faces now, the solutions are going to come from those types of thinkers that you're talking about. Yeah. So actually, it's, it's big thinkers who would really turn you on to spend time with. Or people who think differently, let me put it that way. Yesterday's solutions don't solve today's problems. So it's um, just coming up with new solutions. I'm 
let me ask you a question because something just came into my head. I remembered just now that you had this amazing collection of pinball machines in our right. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Tell me about that. Why pinball machines? Why do you have them? What's them for? What turns you on about? Um, it was, uh, um, growing up in the eighties, um, I, I spent a lot of time at the arcade, like a lot of, a lot of people my age and, um, um, uh, you know, before internet and stuff like that, you had to go be with your community. So in my case, if it's teenagers or whatever, you go to the mall or you go to the arcade or, you know, and, um, so I spent a lot of time there and, uh, I'd always had this, uh, the guy who had the coolest job in the world, I thought was that arcade operator who sat on the stool making change with that change belt. And, um, it always just stayed with me. And then, uh, later in life, I, I just had this thought of like, you know, like the, how cool would that be? And, uh, got into pinball, uh, you know, decades later. Um, but then I had a crazy idea of what if I created an arcade in my house, just like the ones I used to go to, um, why not? Like, like, why not? So I did. <laughs> um, and I created this arcade called Frolics Arcade. Um, and, uh, it's not a business, but it's set up to look exactly like one, including having custom minted tokens with my logo on it and merchandise for the staff, which is me with the word staff on the back. And I have a cap so I can be that arcade operator. And, uh, we will do this, uh, you know, we'll host people at it and we'll do some charity functions, uh, with this really cool space. I love it. I love it. Chris, thank you for sharing everything you've shared. What I want to do in this moment is reflect back to you what I've heard. Maybe in a way that you'll hear it or see it in a way that what will just look like life to you may seem different in this moment. Uh, so let's play. You can mute yourself if you like for a moment. I want to just see what comes. All right. Let me tell you about Chris Frolick. What most people know about Chris is that he built a software company the credit a platform has been used by over 25 million people. Back in the 90s, he was known as one of the world's best selling DJs in the rave scene. Chris has been a tech nerd his entire life. But underneath that, Chris has been driven because of two things. He has a really low threshold for boredom and a really high threshold for risk. Do anything for too long, he'll be bored with it. And, and if it's not risky enough, he'll up the game. Despite being known, or maybe because he was known as one of the world's best DJs, he never pre-planned a set. As he would put it, he liked to live on the edge. A great live DJ is actually controlling the flow of energy, feeling the crowd, witnessing the crowd, and using the music to play with the crowd. Back when he was six years old, Chris loved Star Wars. What he would do is play in his room for hours, creating scenes for the characters. He would be, back then, what was called in the zone, what we now called being in flow. And that's how he spent his life, whether he was making scenes in Star Wars and he was six, on stage in front of thousands and thousands of people as a DJ doing live sets, or coding and creating the software that been used by millions of people. And here's the interesting thing about Chris. What most people don't know or don't see in him is that he felt like an imposter for much of his life. It felt like he was lucky in his career. He felt like he's had a persona that he's been wearing, a mask where he's been afraid of being found 
out. Here's the thing, of course. There's an old definition of luck. Luck is where opportunity meets preparation. This man has been driven his entire life by the idea of what's next. In fact, if you say the words to Chris, it can't be done, he literally rubs his hands together and begins to think of how it can be done. Chris has comfort in creating something new and something exciting. There was, there's a quote I want to read out loud, which was read at Robert Kennedy's funeral by Ted Kennedy. Ted's, Ted said, when people think of my brother, they think this. Here's the line. Some men see things as they are and ask why. Robert Kennedy dreams of things that never were and ask why not. That is Chris. For Chris, yesterday's solutions don't solve today's problems. If you've got a track record of success behind you and you look back at it and you feel like you were lucky or you were lazy, despite the admiration of everyone around you, if you're wondering what's next, or if you're wrestling with a problem or a challenge where everyone around you says it cannot be done, you need to sit and have a conversation with Chris. You can unmute Chris, tell me. How's that land? Uh, I love it. Um, um, so you take your time to think for a moment, and I want to speak to you guys who are listening. This is really common when I do this with people. They don't have many words because what I've done is reflect back to them the things that they took for granted, they dismissed, they thought they were challenges, were actually were their gifts, and they're all on a speech loss. It doesn't matter too much if there's words that come or not now, Chris. I do understand where you are in this moment. Sorry, so for people not watching, and my mouth's open, and <laughs> he's like, I it's opening. The, the silence. Um, yeah, and uh, you don't have to say anything. Yeah, here's what I've got. And this is what I make closes the loop for me when I first met you. You're in this place of wondering: Do I want coaching clients? Should I be a coach? What? No, you don't want what most people want, which is an ordinary coaching client with an ordinary job. But if someone comes to you and they're a big thinker, they're pondering what's next or they've got this challenge of it can't be done, that gets your juices flowing and you're going to want to sit down and have a conversation. And it won't matter whether it's an hour of time, whether it's five hours sitting in your in your Kimball room, or, or whether it's a conversation once a month, that will get you excited. And the moment they've solved the problem, you'll be done. You'll want to move off to the next one. I think that. I mean, that's exactly it. And this is why I've been um, um, taking my time trying to figure this out because my solution is not going to be off off the rack. Um, so I, I have to, cre- it's about creating something new right now. And, and I know this, and, and that includes finding a new kind of client and dealing with them in a, in a different way. And um, so that's, and that's, the journey that I'm on right now and I'm like what a gift it is for to have this time to explore this and find that my, my sense is that either this is the words you lead with or it's in the front of your website it's almost a very simple website and it says if you're the kind of person who hears the words that can't be done and you think hell no and start to rub your hands together because you've already begun thinking about how it can be done you and I should have a conversation. I mean, that speaks to me. That's, I mean, you're, you're, you're getting me right here. Um, in the chest. Um, if I, 
I would love to have a conversation with that person for sure. So Chris, let's pause. We're there. Uh, anything more we can come in another conversation when you and I speak another time. Yep. Thank you for trusting me. And I love this. I had this vision of a single page website with that line at the front. Um, that's it. Because they're your people. You're not looking for everyday coaching clients. You're not even looking for many coaching clients. You're looking for the right people. And this idea of rent Chris's brain is what comes to mind. Wow, I'm going to sit down with you and brainstorm an idea that everyone else is saying can't be done. That's going to have you rubbing your hands together and your clients, the right people for you, letting their hairs. Thanks, Chris. This is Uh Thank you. It was extremely fun. So, thank you, Rich. For most of human history, it wasn't called coaching. It was called leadership. And it's what I love to do, to coach people, to lead people, and to mess with people's thinking. If you'd like more of this, or if you'd like to learn more about our community of extraordinary top performers, go to richlitvin.com forward slash one insight.